Gilbert Chickley is a name that's synonymous with fraud, deception, and scams. This notorious con man has made headlines around the world for his elaborate schemes that have swindled millions of dollars from unsuspecting victims. Chickley's story is a cautionary tale about the dangers of greed and the consequences that come with it. Born in 1964 in Paris, Chickley grew up in a middle-class family. From a young age, he showed a talent for deception and manipulation, using his charm and quick wit to get what he wanted. Chickley's childhood scams were relatively simple, but they were effective in helping him develop his confidence and skills. One of his earliest scams involved him pretending to be a wealthy businessman, complete with a suit and a briefcase. He would approach people on the street and strike up a conversation, claiming that he was looking for investment opportunities. He would then ask his target to give him some money as a show of good faith, promising to repay them with interest later on. Of course, he never repaid anyone, but he managed to scam several people along the way. Another of Chickley's scams involved him selling fake concert tickets. He would create a fake ticket stub using a photocopier and sell it to unsuspecting concert goers outside the venue. He would usually target people who looked desperate to get in or who were late for the show, knowing that they were more likely to fall for a scam. Chickley's scams may have been small in scale, but they laid the foundation for his later criminal activities. He learned how to manipulate people how to create convincing personas, and how to think on his feet when things didn't go according to plan. These skills would serve him well in his later scams, but they would also eventually lead to his downfall. One of Chickley's most notorious scams involved impersonating a high-ranking executive of a major French bank. Using sophisticated techniques, Chickley was able to convince bank employees to wire large sums of money to offshore accounts controlled by him and his accomplices. His methods were, to put it frankly, absolutely insane, like something out of a James Bond movie. We'll go into more detail later, but for now, here's how he got started. Before he could start scamming his victims, Chickley needed to assemble a team, much like Danny Ocean did in the iconic film Ocean's Eleven. Except this was real life, and these scams were potentially more dangerous. His team was helmed by Chickley's right-hand man and the other con man named in the case, Anthony Lazarevich, who played a crucial role in executing the frauds. Lazarevich was born in Marseille, France in 1977. He came from a middle-class family and had a good education, attending one of the best high schools in the city. However, Lazarevich had a taste for the extravagant and the luxurious, and he soon found himself drawn to a life of crime. Lazarevich met Gilbert Chickley in the early 2000s, and the two quickly became partners in crime. Chickley was a skilled con man with a talent for impersonation and social engineering, while Lazarevich had a gift for technology and computer hacking. Together, they formed a formidable team. Chickley's most notorious scam was the bank CEO scam, which began in 2010. In this scheme, Chickley posed as a high-ranking executive of a major French bank, often using the name Jean-Claude Van Damme as an alias. He would call the bank's other executives and convince them to transfer large sums of money to offshore accounts controlled by him and his accomplices. Chickley used a variety of sophisticated techniques to make the scam seem legitimate. He would often use voice-changing software to alter his voice and sound like the actual CEO of the bank. He also had the accomplices who would pose as lawyers and provide convincing legal documents to support the scam. What made Chickley's scheme so effective was his use of realistic silicone masks to create convincing personas for himself. By altering his appearance, he was able to create the illusion of being a different person each time he made a video call. He even went so far as to create fake LinkedIn profiles and other social media accounts to lend credibility to his various personas. Chickley's use of silicone masks to perpetuate his crimes is a reminder of the power of technology to enable deception. While most people are familiar with the concept of phishing scams and other online frauds, Chickley's use of masks and other props takes this kind of fraud to a new level. One of his other notable scams involved Turkish business magnate Inan Karak. In 2015, Karak received a call from someone claiming to be the French defense minister, Jean-Yves Le Drian. The caller informed Karak that he was in the process of acquiring a large oil field in Africa and needed Karak's assistance to ensure the deal went through smoothly. Over the course of several months, Karak was in regular content with the supposed French defense minister. He was asked to wire money to various accounts in order to facilitate the acquisition of the oil field. Initially, the amounts requested were small, but as time went on, the amounts grew larger and larger. Eventually, Karak was asked to wire 40 
$27 million in ransom money to a bank account in China. The caller claimed that the money was necessary to secure the release of French hostages held in Syria. Karat complied and wired the money, but the hostages were never released. It was later discovered that the person posing as Jean-Yves Le Drian was in fact Gilbert Chickley, using advanced voice manipulation technology to convince Karak that he was the French defense minister. Chickley had used the same tactics to con other wealthy individuals out of millions of dollars. In 2016, he added another feather to his cap when he conned Prince Aga Khan, the spiritual leader of Ismaili Muslims, while impersonating the French defense minister, Jean-Yves Le Drian. Aga Khan, whose full name is Prince Shah Karim al Husseini, is a spiritual leader and philanthropist who is widely respected for his efforts in promoting peace, pluralism, and development across the world. Born on December 13th, 1936 in Geneva, Switzerland, Aga Khan is the eldest son of Prince Ali Khan and his wife, Princess Tajudwala Ali Khan. His grandfather, Sir Sultan Muhammad Shah Aga Khan III, was the spiritual leader of the Ismaili community and a prominent figure in the Indian independence movement. Aga Khan spent his early childhood in Nairobi, Kenya, before moving to Switzerland for his education. He attended La Rosi, a prestigious boarding school in Switzerland, and later went on to study at Harvard University and the University of Geneva. In 1957, at the age of 20, Aga Khan became the 49th Imam, spiritual leader, of the Ismaili community, succeeding his grandfather. Since then, he has worked tirelessly to promote the values of his faith, which emphasizes the importance of social justice, pluralism, intellectual pursuit. Under Aga Khan's leadership, the Ismaili community has undergone a period of significant growth and modernization. He has established a number of institutions and organizations, including the Aga Khan Development Network, which is a group of agencies that work to promote social, economic, and cultural development in various parts of the world. The Khan started with Chickley posing as Le Drian and contacting Aga Khan's office seeking a meeting with the spiritual leader. A meeting was arranged, but it had to be postponed as Le Drian's schedule didn't allow for it. However, Chickley used the opportunity to build a rapport with the office staff. After several phone conversations, Chickley requested a loan of 20 million euro, which he claimed was to secure the release of hostages held in Syria. He also promised that the money would be repaid within a few days. Aga Khan, who wasn't aware of the scheme, approved the loan, and the money was wired to a bank account in China. However, as the days passed, it became clear that the money would not be repaid. Aga Khan realized that he had been conned and immediately notified the authorities. The French police launched an investigation, and it was later discovered that the person posing as Jean-Yves Le Drian was none other than Gilbert Chickley. In 2017, he was convicted and sentenced to seven years in prison for his role in the bank scam. He was also ordered to pay back the stolen funds. Despite his conviction, Chickley remains a controversial figure in France. Some see him as a Robin Hood-like figure, taking from the rich and powerful and giving to the poor. Others view him as a ruthless criminal who deserves to spend the rest of his life behind bars. The evidence suggests the latter is probably true. After his many multi-million dollar scams, Chickley had the money he'd always wanted, but he couldn't spend it. He needed a way to proverbially clean the money before he could brazenly spend it the way he wanted to. So he found the most efficient way to launder money in the world through China. Money laundering is a global phenomenon that affects every country in the world, and China is no exception. Despite China's efforts to combat money laundering, the problem persists, and the country remains a major hub for illicit financial activity. China's booming economy and its large and complex financial system make it an attractive destination for money launderers. Criminals use a variety of methods to launder money in China, including trade-based money laundering, underground banking, and the use of virtual currencies. Trade-based money laundering involves using international trade transactions to disguise illicit funds. Criminals will use inflated invoices or underpriced goods to move money across borders undetected. This is a common method of money laundering in China, where the country's large volume of international trade provides ample opportunities for criminal activity. Underground banking is another popular method of money laundering in China. This involves the use of informal networks of individuals or companies to transfer funds across borders without going through traditional banking channels. These networks operate outside of the regulated financial system, making it difficult to track their activities. Virtual currencies such as Bitcoin are increasingly being used for money laundering in China. Criminals can use Bitcoin to move funds across borders without detection as the currency operates independently of the traditional financial system. The Chinese government has taken steps to combat money laundering in recent years. In 2020, the country passed a new anti-money laundering law that increased penalties for money laundering and introduced new requirements for financial institutions to monitor and report suspicious transactions. However, there's still much work to be done to address the problem. One of the biggest challenges facing China's efforts to combat money laundering is the country's lack of transparency. China's financial system is highly opaque, and the government often limits access to information about financial
financial transaction. This makes it difficult for law enforcement agencies to track and investigate suspicious financial activity. Chickley was able to utilize this system to clean the millions he stole and use it primarily for he and his associates gains. One of his associates, surely vacant, and an old flame of Chickley's proved to be one of the most impactful members of the group and someone who made considerable amounts of money. Vacant, a French woman in her 30s, was living in Israel when she reconnected with Chickley in 2013. The two had dated briefly years earlier and Chickley reached out to her on social media after his release from prison in 2009. Vacant, who had fallen on hard times and was struggling financially, was initially hesitant to get involved in Chickley's criminal activities, but he was persuasive and she eventually agreed to join him in his bank fraud scheme. According to court documents, Vacant played a crucial role in the operation, helping Chickley to set up bank accounts and providing him with fake identities and forged documents. She also made numerous phone calls to company executives pertaining to be a bank official and convincing them to transfer money into the fraudulent accounts. The scale of the fraud was staggering. Chickley was known to have a particular weakness for luxury cars. He owned a fleet of expensive vehicles, including a Lamborghini and a Ferrari, which he would often park outside exclusive nightclubs and restaurants to impress his friends and associates. He also spent lavishly on designer clothes and accessories, always dressing in the latest fashions from the most exclusive brands. Vacant, for her part, enjoyed the finer things in life as well. She would often travel to luxury resorts and spas, staying in the most opulent suites, and indulging in all the right treatments and services they had to offer. She was also known to frequent high-end boutiques, buying designer clothes and accessories without a second thought. Chickley eventually found a safe spot to spend his millions in Israel, where he enjoyed a life of luxury and indulgence, living in a mansion that was the envy of many, a lifestyle he said would never be encroached by authorities. Chickley's time in Israel was marked by his lavish lifestyle and his taste for the finer things in life. He owned a sprawling mansion in the affluent neighborhood of Savion, which is known for its opulent homes and wealthy residents. The mansion was estimated to be worth several million dollars and boasted a large swimming pool, a tennis court, and a guest house. Chickley's neighbors were often impressed by his extravagant lifestyle, which seemed to be funded by his various scams and frauds. He was known to host lavish parties at his mansion, with guests arriving in luxury cars and wearing designer clothes. Chickley himself was always impeccably dressed, often seen in tailored suits and expensive watches. However, Chickley's opulent lifestyle wasn't without its risks. He was constantly under scrutiny of authorities, who were aware of his criminal past and were monitoring his activity closely. Meanwhile, Chickley was boldly telling reporters that he couldn't be touched here in Israel and that the authorities could not arrest him here. If you're enjoying this story about Gilbert Chickley, definitely stay tuned on this video to watch our previous release about how she managed to pretend to be a Saudi princess. Chickley's lifestyle came to an end in 2015, when he was arrested while hiding in Ukraine and extradited to France to face trial for his various frauds and schemes. When the police raided Chickley's home, they found a silicon mask designed to resemble the Prince of Monaco, suggesting to authorities that Chickley was planning a Mission Impossible S scheme. He was eventually sentenced to seven years in prison, which he is concurrently serving. His mansion in Savion was seized by the authorities and sold at auction, with the proceeds going towards compensating his victims. Chickley's time in Israel is a cautionary tale about the dangers of living a life of luxury and indulgence particularly when it's funded by illegal activities. While he may have enjoyed a life of excess for a time, it ultimately came at a cost, as he would get caught and brought to justice for his crimes. Today, his mansion stands as a reminder of the consequences of fraudulent behavior and the importance of living an honest and ethical life. In court, Chikli and Lazarevich were unrepentant, and they continued to insist that their actions were justified. They argued that they were only taking money from large, faceless corporations, and that they were weren't hurting anyone directly. However, the court wasn't swayed by their arguments, and both men were convicted and sentenced to prison. On April 7th, 2023, the Paris court handed down its verdict, sentencing Chickley to 11 years in prison and Lazarevich to eight years. Both men were also ordered to pay fines of 2 million euro and 1.5 million euro, respectively. The court's decision has been welcomed by authorities and the public who see it as a strong message for those who want to engage in financial fraud. In recent years, the prevalence of such scams has risen significantly as criminals become more sophisticated in their methods and take advantage of the anonymity provided by the internet. Chickley may be the first of his kind, but he won't be the last. Chickley's story has been the inspiration for the 2015 French film Je Compte Sur Vous, which means I'm counting on you in French. The film tells the story of a fictional character named Gilbert Perez, played by Vincent Elbaz, who's based on Chickley. The film shows how highly sophisticated Chickley's schemes were and involved detailed research about the targeted companies and individuals. He would gather information 
information about the company's internal hierarchy, the names of senior executives, and their personal information, such as dates of birth and family details. Armed with this information, Chickley would call up the company's employees using spoofed phone numbers to make it seem as if he were calling from the executive's office. The film goes on to explore Perez's motivations and his relationships with his accomplices, his family, and the victims of his scams. The film was praised for its nuanced portrayal of Perez, who is shown as a complex character rather than a one-dimensional villain. The film also explores the psychological toll of Chickley's scams on his victims. Many of the individuals and businesses targeted by Chickley lost millions of dollars, and some were left emotionally devastated by the experience. The film shows how the victims of Perez's scam struggle to come to terms with the betrayal and the loss of their money. Sarah Alamudi, also known as the Vamp in Veil, arrived at a London court each morning in a Rolls Royce Phantom. She emerged from her luxury car surrounded by bodyguards, including some assigned to carry her handbag and her 50,000 pound diamond encrusted phone. Photographers snapped pictures of the green-eyed woman in her burqa as she strutted across the pavement. Days before, she testified under oath to spending $1.4 million on perfume over two months. Under her burqa, she appeared to be wearing designer heels. Every so often, Alamudi stretched out her arm, revealing a wrist covered with gold jewelry and a gem-studded Rolex. Meanwhile, she was on trial for stealing 14 million pounds worth of property. Alamudi claimed she was a Saudi-born heiress who married at a young age. However, she was forced to leave the country after having an adulterous relationship. To some friends, she was the daughter of Mohammed bin al Amudi, the owner of an upscale hotel in Jeddah and one of the wealthiest men in Saudi Arabia. She told others that she was a member of the Saudi royal family. One man who met al Amudi several years prior believed she was the estranged wife of the Saudi Arabian leader King Abdullah. One of her other boyfriends thought she was Osama bin Laden's daughter. Another time, when she successfully applied for a £4 million mortgage, she convinced HSBC Bank that she was the daughter of Sheikh Mohammed Hussein Alamudi, one of the wealthiest men in the world. According to Alamudi, her royal family sent her suitcases stuffed with £100,000 cash as a weekly allowance. Others allege Alamudi was nothing more than a high-end escort. Alamudi claimed she was friends with Kate Moss and even dated Colin Farrell, Joaquin Phoenix, and a professional soccer player named Freddie Lungenberg. She's also the ex-girlfriend of a Swedish male model named Patrick Ribsader. In a 2010 trial, Ribsader said Alamudi never wore a burqa while they dated. She preferred designer clothing instead. Ribsader also said that Alamudi loved going to expensive restaurants, bars, and nightclubs and drank champagne every night. She was involved with several other men over the years, including one simply known as Sammy, whom she would have a daughter with. Apparently, Alamudi used her daughter to get a variety of men to pay her child support. Gerald Jerko Zoiko, a private security contractor who lost his life in Iraq, may have been married to Alamudi for a time. Then, in a 2008 business meeting, she referred to a man named Cliff Besley, an Australian triathlon champion, as her fiancé. We can't say if she actually dated these men, but the vamp clearly had high standards. She was also involved with another man named Elliot Nickel, a property developer worth around £25 million. In 2008, in 2006, Alamudi and three other women, said to be her sisters, split time between Elliot's central London flat and his house in the country. Then, in December 2009, Mr. Nickel passed away from alcohol poisoning. Rumor has it that Elliot was fascinated with the occult, and Alamudi used to call him from a phone number ending in 666-666. Last on the list was a wealthy older man named Dominic Brown. You may know him as Lord Meerworth, a member of the British Parliament. Alamudi and Lord Meerworth maintained a close relationship for several years. She even proposed to him at one point. On at least one occasion, Meerworth and Alamudi dined together at the House of Lords. When the defense called Lord Meerworth as a witness for Alamudi, he said she was a trustworthy person. A London furniture dealer named Neget Ali came forward after seeing a photo of Alamudi without her veil and claimed she wasn't of royal blood. She wasn't even Saudi Arabian. Ali said Alamudi was actually from Ethiopia. She explained that she first met Alamudi in Yemen 
around 1985 and worked with her in a restaurant owned by Alamudi's mother. The two moved to Dubai shortly after, where Alamudi became a lady of the night. Years later, the two women reconnected at a London club and became friends again. She said they shared an apartment, but eventually went their separate ways after Alamudi borrowed 500 pounds and never paid her back. Naget believed Alamudi wasn't really a Muslim and only wore a burqa so she couldn't be recognized by old acquaintances and victims. Her 14 million pound court case hinged on Alamudi posing as a Saudi princess and developing a friendship with two people named Ian Patton and Amanda Clutterbuck. Amanda claimed that she was introduced to Alamudi by her friend and business associate, Elliot Nickel, and that Elliot vouched for Alamudi's royal status. Alamudi led Ian and Amanda to believe she had limitless wealth and was well-connected with wealthy business people in the Middle East. She told them she was interested in investing in their 14 million pound property and promised they'd make over 100,000 pounds on the deal. But there was a catch. To speed up the deal, Ian and Amanda had to temporarily transfer ownership of the property over over to the Vamp and Vale. While that sounded shady, Amanda trusted Elliot's judgment and signed the dotted line. Then, during a drunken stupor, Elliot admitted Alamudi wasn't Saudi royalty. She was an escort and a smart one at that. Alamudi responded to the accusations claiming Patton was actually her ex-lover and that he signed over the properties to repay a debt to her. She explained that Patton was an addict and over 10 years took millions of dollars from her to sustain his addiction. During the trial, Ian Patton and Amanda Clutterbuck's legal team focused on discrediting Alamudi and showing that she lied about who she was, her royal status, and how much money Money she had. They also tried to show the court that Alamudi was a former street worker. For the most part, Alamudi's lawyers ignored those claims. After hearing the case, Justice Sarah Jane Asplin ruled in Alamudi's favor. She believed Patton did incur a debt with Alamudi and the properties were transferred as payment. She also thought Nigat Ali was paid to give false statements so she didn't accept her testimony as evidence. The judge was just getting started. She believed Alamudi never referred to herself as a princess, so she didn't technically break any laws. As far as her identity was concerned, Asplin didn't deem it relevant to the case. Ian and Amanda refused to accept the outcome and filed for an appeal presenting additional evidence. A witness named Fatima Rady came forward after seeing a photo of Alamudi and testified that the vamp in Vale was indeed a street worker. On one occasion, she discovered her husband in a hotel room with Alamudi. A man named Kevin Beard also gave a statement that he was Alamudi's driver driver and chauffeured her and two friends for nearly five years. Kevin said Alamudi and the other women worked as escorts, were frequently drunk, and liked to use party powder. The legal team also alleged that Alamudi's birth certificate was fake and that she was in the country illegally. The next judge rejected their appeal. They agreed with Judge Asplin, believing Alamudi's true identity wasn't crucial to the case and wouldn't change the outcome. The defeat crushed Ian and Amanda emotionally and financially. They owed roughly one and a half million pounds and court costs, but weren't done with the vamp and veil. Not yet. Perhaps they could convince the London police to reopen the case. Amanda and Ian knew it wouldn't get them their money or property, but by now it wasn't about that. They wanted to see Alamudi behind bars and were willing to do whatever it took. But once again, things did not go their way. The London Metropolitan Police informed Ian and Amanda they were shutting down the investigation. Alamudi would not be charged with a crime. Patton and Clutterbuck responded by enacting their victim's right to review, which is a system that allows accusers to appeal when the police decide not to charge someone. The police reviewed the specifics and confirmed they would stand by the their original decision not to charge Alamudi. Ian and Amanda had one card left to play. They'd bring the case back to court, hoping a judge would overrule the police department. This time, Ian's brother George represented the couple. He explained that because of the trial's outcome, Amanda and Ian, as well as their extended family, were out millions of dollars. He described how Ian and Amanda lost their home and had to file for bankruptcy after Alamudi stole their property. George said the police acted irrationally. Not charging Alamudi was ridiculous, as there was more than enough evidence to slap the cuffs on. In Patton's eyes, they had an extraordinary case on their hands, one that involved a master con woman and a series of deplorable crimes. He told the judge they had DNA evidence proving Alamudi was not a Saudi. They could prove the birth certificate she used in 2008 when she applied for a mortgage with HSBC was fake, and that Alamudi presented fake evidence to the Asylum and Immigration Tribunal and during her trial. He described that the police reported Alamudi as being unfit to be interviewed, but said he had no idea how 
how they could make that determination. They never did anything to verify her physical health or mental status. Lawyers for the Metropolitan Police responded and said their detectives reviewed the case and found too many problems with charging Alamudi. It wasn't worth taking her to court, but they did come close. They considered the fraud case in which Alamudi was exonerated and concluded that the Saudi government didn't cooperate when they asked them to help figure out who Alamudi was. They didn't have the manpower or resources required for a complex investigation, and they didn't have any evidence proving Alamudi was guilty of identity fraud. George Patton challenged that conclusion, saying they ignored strong evidence discovered by a Saudi law firm. Still, the judge decided to shut the investigation down. After all, any court would be concerned about overturning a police decision after the police had thoroughly analyzed a case. As if it helped, the judge sympathized with Ian and Amanda's plight. He understood how frustrated they probably were, and not seeing Alamudi behind bars must be crushing. He continued by saying that the police provided good reasons as to why they chose to end the investigation and that they weren't required to explain their decision regarding every piece of evidence. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you think is easier to say no to. Hitting the no tip button on the iPad when you're getting takeout at a restaurant or saying no to people approaching you attempting to get you to try a sample.